you are great you are great I, th- I actually I just feel like the Holy Spirit is wanting us to sing this and declare this with some Zulu words that are equivalent so ladies I'm asking you to just step up to the mic and just let's just sing let's sing in KwaZulu Natal that King Jesus is great in the local vernacular just declare and sing in some Zulu words so let's go let's go Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Come on. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, we are worshipping in the spirit realm. Father, we are declaring things in the spirit realm. Lord, we are we are honoring and glorifying you in the spirit. We are saying in this region, Jesus be glorified. Jesus be glorified. Let's give the Lord a hand. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Contin <laughs> Kias kaya indi anda, konti te da ta kara bashkuru dunia. Kiara bashkuru dunia. My people, I say to you, arise this morning. 
Arise this morning. I have put a roar, the roar of lions and lionesses inside of you. I'm saying do not wait for the next person or the next person, but I have called you. I've put within you the things that I have got for you to release to the world. Rise up, stand up. My people arise, arise because I am arising. I am arising. Your king is here. Rise up, my people. Rise up. Rise up. Lord, in response to that word, Lord, if that resonated with you, maybe just just put one hand up. This is not to show anybody else but the Lord that you receive that word to rise up. Lord, may you just see, see these hands, Lord. And Lord, as we respond to the call and the word to rise up, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that as you call, you empower. And so right now, I release the empowering by your spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Lord, I release that spirit to empower the yes in every single person who hears this word. As we say, yes, Lord, we're going to rise up for you. I don't know in what situation. Lord, I pray you show us. You show each one of us. It means different things, different places, different spaces that you're calling, causing us to rise up in the power and the spirit and the anointing of God. God cause us to rise up in those spaces. Forgive us for times that we've shrunk back, held back, um, just, just withheld the virtue, the righteousness, and the places that you want us to occupy. And so, Father, by the Spirit of God, we say, empower us, Lord, to step into those places and spaces, Father, in those, in our vocation, in relationships, Father. There are spaces you are, you are unctioning us to move into. We put up a hand and say, here we are, Lord. Send us. Send us, Lord. Just as you sent the prophets of old, Lord. We receive that same mandate, Lord, into those places and spaces you in calling us to. In Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. And the people of God shouted, Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Well done, band. Thank you guys for stepping up to the plate. And uh, we really do appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. Okay. So uh, my name is, is Jacques. And together with my lovely wife, Jenny, uh, we are the senior pastors of His People Church. And what a privilege and what a delight to be with you, to worship with you, to 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 send shock waves into the spiritual realm with you. I, I'm telling you, I mean, I love personal worship, but this morning, could you sense that corporate anointing? The, you know, the Bible says we're two, or ma- we're, one will set a thousand to flight, but we're two, two will set a thousand to flight. I mean, how much impact in the spirit did we have as we came together in unity? We sang, we declared together. I just felt boom in this region. We were shaking things and shifting things through our worship and through our declaration. So thank you so much this morning. And welcome to His People Church. If it's your first time at His People here in Peter Maritzburg, won't you just wave at us? We just want to welcome you. Are there any first timers here this morning? Okay. Well, um, we often have online. And so if you online, uh, I suppose there's no point in waving at us this morning, but we just want to let you know, welcome. And uh, we know that... uh, this goes far and wide, so we trust you just really enjoy your time with us this morning. And um, then just a couple of announcements. Uh, every week we've got to actually just highlight our health and safety protocols, and they'll be on the screen for you. I'm not going to run through them, you know, but 
just significantly, we want to, we want to highlight up to now, we've asked you to pre-register using Eventbrite, which is an online app, and we're just trying to make it as easy as possible rather than filling out pages of forms. And according to the government regulations, we have to keep that info for track and trace purposes, and we have to keep that info for six months, okay? It's government regulations. And so obviously, we 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 complying and, and want to comply with that. But what we are feeling and what we want to just communicate with you is that if you have already registered through Eventbrite, in other words, we've captured your info, um, and your info hasn't changed or you're not a first-time visitor, then we're saying you don't have to uh, fill in that info and register every week. What we will do if we have to do track and trace, we will go and look and get your info that's all that you've already put in, if you've already registered once before on Eventbrite. The only exception would be is if your contact info changes, you're moving, you're changing numbers, the people you're staying with changes, because remember that's all important for track and trace purposes. And also, if obviously you're a first-time visitor, then we won't have that info. We're trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for you to register. We still will ask you the questions at the door. We'll take you for your 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 temperature, ask you, you know, have you been in contact? Have you had any symptoms? We have to do that. Okay, that has to be. We can't not do that. But that's not all your contact info. So we're just trying to make it as streamlined as possible. And if you have any questions, please speak to Clumelo. She's the lady at the back waving at you. She's our administrator. If you have any questions about registration, speak to Clu. Thank you so much. And then next week, we're so delighted. We are having our Thanksgiving service. So at church next week, we'll come together, we'll have worship. But then what we are doing, we are we have in, in asking you and some of you have come forward and said, I have something I want to testify and I want to give thanks to the Lord about. And if you would still like to, then please could you either speak to my wife Jenny or to Flumelo as well. Just let them know and we will contact you and just chat to you and find out exactly what's on your heart. And because we, we want to we want to just have a time next week of praising God. And, and you may say, well, why, why do this? And I want to actually share this. So I saw this this morning. Peely posted this on her WhatsApp status. And I thought it was just brilliant. She said, when gratitude becomes an essential foundation in our lives, miracles start to appear everywhere. Isn't that beautiful? When gratitude becomes an essential foundation in our lives. Okay, it's not just something you do just, uh, it's, it's, it's Thanksgiving uh, service. It's a foundation in our lives. Miracles start to appear everywhere. And I was just thinking about the story of where Jesus fed the 5,000. And you know, in that story, Jesus wasn't actually looking to feed 5,000. They were tired. They'd been ministering. He said to his disciples, let's go to a remote place. They get in the boat. They cross the lake. When they get there, there's a crowd of people waiting for him. They're so hungry. And the Bible says Jesus saw these people, and he was moved by compassion. He said this, they are sheep without a shepherd. They, they were yearning for spiritual leadership. And he saw their need and desire for spiritual leadership. So spiritual leaders, ha <laughs> Okay, arise. Jesus is looking for you because he sees the sheep that are requiring the spiritual leadership. And so Jesus ministers to them. He gives them spiritual food, teaches them the word. And then it's getting late. Jesus has been teaching for a while. And the disciples say to Jesus, say, Lord, listen, it's getting late. It's getting dark. There are no villages nearby. These people need to get food. Why don't you send them away so they can go get food? And Jesus says to his disciples, he turns around, he says, why send them away? You feed them. I can imagine the disciples' reaction. Feed them? What? Where? You know, kind of James turning to Peter and P Peter turning to John. said, Did you bring something? How are we going to do this? And then they said, well, all we have is five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus takes the five loaves and two fishes. And this is what the Bible says. It says, um, and it's in Mark chapter 6. You can go and read it. It's also Matthew 14. The story is repeated. It says Jesus took those five loaves and two fish. 
And it says, he looked to heaven and he gave thanks. Gratitude. All he did, he gave thanks. And then he took the bread and he started breaking. And he broke. And he broke. And he just broke until there was enough for 5,000 people to eat. And 12 baskets left over. And the same with the fish. But folks, all he did was give thanks. And, and what Peely posted was, when gratitude becomes an essential foundation in our lives, miracles start to appear everywhere. Folks, you see, thanksgiving, firstly, who are you giving thanks to? When you are giving thanks to the Lord, your eyes are on the Lord. And when your eyes are on the Lord, not on the problems, not on the lack, not all the hungry people, not all the needs, but Lord, thank you for what you have provided. Thank you for these five loaves and two fish. Lord, I thank you for what the breakthrough I've already got. I celebrate this. They prayed for me and my pain is 50% gone. God, I praise you that my pain is 50% gone. That unlocks the miracle for the healing to continue. Praise God for the provision that you have. Do you give thanks when you have meals at night and every morning, etc.? Folks, it's so important because it unlocks an expectation of more from the Lord. Because gratitude focuses on the Lord. Amen. And so, that is what the Thanksgiving service is about. And yes, sure, not everybody can testify. I trust everybody would have something they could give thanks about. And maybe next Sunday you won't get the mic and get to give thanks. But I trust that there will be some, some things that you can give thanks for, even in 2020. You know, I believe giving thanks in a year like this is going to be so much more significant than, let's say, a normal year. Finding things to give thanks to God for when you've been through a tough time is an amazing testimony of faith. In a God that is good no matter what. Amen. And so flowing out of that, I'm wanting us to, to actually uh, just take up the tithes and offerings. And folks, I'm actually not going to share an exhortation about bringing out tithes and offerings. I want to do a simple prayer that Jesus did. I want to thank the Lord that you have finances with which that you can bring to the house of the Lord. I'm going to thank the Lord for the five loaves and two fish. And I'm going to trust the Lord that firstly, He would multiply your seed that you are sowing. And the Bible says He multiplies seed to the sower. Important, He multiplies seed to the sower. In other words, if you don't sow, is that seed going to be multiplied? I'm going to thank God for the seed that is in your bank account or your wallet. That's all I'm going to do. And we're going to take up the tithes and offerings. Amen. We're going to trust God to do the miracle in your life, in all our lives. So Jesus, Lord, that, that, that night, Lord, it was getting dark. Lord, I can just picture it getting dark. And Lord, in front of 5,000 people, you just take five loaves and two fish. It seems crazy. It seems, but Lord, you looked to heaven. Lord, and we just symbolically, maybe just if you can, just look, look up. Lord, we look to you and we give thanks, Lord. Lord, we give thanks, Lord, for every cent that is in our bank account or in our wallets. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the two fish and the five loaves. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we do, we do give the seed that you have given us to sow because, Lord, you promised you give you multiply seed to the sower. So, Lord, we want to be sowers so we can see the miracle of multiplication, Lord, with our seed. And so we thank you. And we say, Lord, we consecrate the seed to you. Lord, do what seed is meant. Do with the seed what it's meant to do. Multiply. Produce after its kind. I pray this on every single person. On every single person wallet that is symbolically being held up on every bank account father we thank you we thank you with grateful hearts we are expectant for the god of miracles to do his work 
And the people of God said, Amen. So for tithes and offerings, due to health restrictions, we actually not, we can't pass baskets around. But in the back door over there, we've got a slot in the door, the back of the door, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a box. If you have, you want to bring your physical cash, we're not going to do it now. As you go out after the service, do you mind just popping your finances in there? And uh, obviously, if you do give by EFT, then you also obviously welcome to do that as well. God bless you. Okay, it's now my great delight to welcome the love of my life, my wife. <laughs> I'm a poet and I know it. Okay, Jenny's gonna come and <laughs> Jenny's gonna come and bring the word this morning. And uh, won't you just open your hearts as she does, Lord? I want to thank you for your anointing, Lord, on your word. Amen. I want to thank you for your anointing on your servant as well. And Lord, I also want to ask for your anointing, not just on the pulpit and in the pulpit, but in the pew, Lord. Because it's, it's our hearts where this word, the seed of your word, must find a place. And so Lord, I pray for every heart that we would find a place in our hearts for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen and amen, and it's wonderful. I just start talking, and you can hear me, because Sakiso is on the board. <laughs> can we just give a round of applause to the those who are serving, to Sakiso and Cynthia and Londi? Amen. And Gunkle and Jono, and uh, we've already said thank you to the worship team. And uh, I'm... I want to play you, I want them to play you, a little video that is a little bit of a summary of what Pastor Jacques spoke about last week, and we are going to be continuing on this week. And we have been looking at your shape, and what is your shape? Who are you, and what is your shape? How did God make you? And and so... I'm trusting. Are we good? Can we go? Okay. Go for it, guys. Okay, we're getting preached to by a child this morning. Hey, church. Me and Pastor are here to bring you pleasure once again and joy. Today we're talking about spiritual gifts, and today... I have a good old friend, Mr. Potato Head. Our church is called the Body of Christ. And Mr. Potato Head here represents our Body of Christ, which is our church. And we have all these parts right here, which represents us. We got the nose, the Mickey Mouse chocolate thing, feet, eyes, arms, ears, everything. If we start doing whatever we want, and trying to stick each other wherever we want, and we do what we want to, we will look like a gross mess of a potato. What? You you wanna be a you wanna be a nose? Fine. Looks kinda weird now. Always talks back, a little sassy. You, what what? You, you want you wanna be feet. You're gonna hate it down here, just so you know. That, that would just be too painful. I don't want to hurt you. What do you wanna be? You wanna be a fashion model, eh? Oh, oh, I am your father. No! Oh, what, what, what's this? Oh, it's a suitcase. This must be the missionaries. So somebody thinks they're a mouth, but really they're an arm, and they try to put their 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 arm in their mouth. How is he gonna eat? Just like put put his hand on his food and then just like absorb it through his hand. Ah, I broke his butt. And we do not want to look like this thing. The thing can't even stand up. Say, and imagine if like your nose was near your butt, like where your arm should be. No one wants to smell that. Or imagine trying to eat where where your head is. Imagine if it was picture day. Like just say smile. Talking about eyes on the back of your head. So this is our church. 
uh, it doesn't work that well. It's kind of messy and uncomfortable and not nice to look at. So the question here is, where do you fit in? Because, you know, a church needs its parts, and every person here needs to be at the right spot. And let's now I reassemble Mr. Potato Head here and make him look nice, adorable, and cute. Now we've got a positive Peter with thumbs up. That is our church. Beautiful with a giant red nose. That is our church. It looks nice. It's beautiful. And our Mr. Potato Head. No. King of the church. So the question is, where do you fit in church? Are you the ears? Help us listen to God. We've got the mouth that can talk to God. Prayer. Worship and everything like that. We need feet to travel places because And the arms that are, can do God's work So everybody's got to find their place in the church and no matter what if your nose eyes mouth arm balloon ear crown feet Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it All of you 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 you, you, you is a part of it like all these pieces fit with the church everyone's a part of the church Everyone fits in, and that's what makes us a good church. And without you, it would not be the same. We're on a hot dog. Yeah, you made a thumbs up. Does this count as a mugging? Okay, <clears throat> so you enjoy that. What's the lesson? Every one of us has a part in the body. And he wants us to play our part and to be part of that. And today we're looking at the third part of our shape. And as, as we've heard about already, um, your hands shaped me and made me. God has shaped us. He has made us. He's put us together he has made us how he, his plan is for us. And, um, and it's just so beautiful when you see people who have discovered they love doing this. This is what their abilities are. They are comfortable with their personality, how God has made them. And, and God has put us all together in a specific way to fulfill the calling and the purpose that he's got for us. And so we have spent two weeks uh, going through this, and we're going to look, I'm going to go, if you can go on to the next slide, Londi, um, I'm going to be looking at the third, uh, the last three parts of shape. And uh, Pastor Jacques spoke about the spiritual gifts and uh the the things like we we were seeing a little bit there with with the potato man and spiritual gifts like uh, bringing a word in tongues and the interpretation and my dear husband said to me Jenny come let us demonstrate a spiritual gift this morning and so <laughs> by faith i i stepped out and i believe that god is calling us to and our heart, we looked last week at what is our heart, what, is, what are the passions in our heart, the people that God is, uh, has put within us for us to, uh, to minister to him and to represent his heart for people. And this week, I am going to attempt to, to share with you and to stimulate your thinking and exploring our abilities our personality and prophetic gifting, and to look at how our experiences are part of who God has made us to be and the importance of it. And I want us to just look at Romans 12, verse 5 and 6, uh, where, where it speaks about, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. And that is Romans 12, verse 5. And, and it's the verse just before 
are the one that is like the key verse for us for today in terms of abilities. And, and that's the verse 6 says, In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And that is speaking about our abilities. And, the rea- and, and God speaking about our abilities but it's within the context of us belonging within a body and the body of Christ, the community of believers. And he says that we are all parts, as the kids' pastor was saying to us, we are all different parts, but we're made in different ways. And, and so, like, our noses are, are positioned, they are created, the, the structure of them what our noses and the cells within our nose, noses are able to do in terms of the, the cilia that are there, the, the small nose hairs, etc. They are created like that to be able to outwork a certain function. Our nose has various, um, various abilities so that it can carry out what a nose is meant to do. And as he said, um, our feet, our feet have certain muscles. They have, uh, they have toes. They have bones that are created in a specific way so that we can walk on them. And the same with us. And the abilities we have are a strong indication of what God wants us to do with our lives. And so many of us, when we're young people, we're like, what does God want us to do? What are the things that we can do? And, and it's we needing to look at our shape, look at the way that he has made us. And it will show us a lot what God has planned for us to do. They are clues to knowing God's will for us. And um, God doesn't waste anything. And so... We are going to look at our abilities, and there are some things that that I'm going to put up a, a, a list in a moment of 50 abilities. Now, we're not going to work that out. You're not going to be able to work it out all now. But I want to show you about, show you how, um, how much ability there is. And this is not exhaustive by any way. And when you look at your abilities, you've you've got to look and say, well, what what are the things that I love to do? What are the things that I love doing? And things that we love doing, they are the things where you can't imagine life without those activities. Okay, You can't imagine life without doing that. It's just part of who you are, and you're good at it. Okay, Like my son, he just has, he is just good at the computer. He is good at working out how things work on the computer. And I'll go to him and I'll go like, Jono, why are you doing that? Because I'm trying to understand, I'm a bit nervous. I'm not, my ability on the computer is not nearly as high as his. And I'm trying to work, what are you doing? Can I trust you in what you're doing? And he's like, mom, I don't, I can't tell you right now, you won't understand, but I just know. <laughs> I'm like, ah! I need to trust you in this. And love it. You can't imagine life without these activities. This is something I'm like, I don't think my son can imagine life without technology. Um, and so someone's saying, yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, like it. These are activities that you may enjoy doing them. You don't need to do them on, an, on a regular basis, but you like doing them. And, and you feel satisfied when you do them. But it's not like, I love it, I have to do this, or this is part of my everyday life. And then there are some abilities and some things that you'd rather do without. 
Okay? These are the kind of things where uh, your wife says to you, honey, we need to. And you can immediately think of like five other things that you really even more need to do, that you actually love and like but you don't like, you don't enjoy this. You can live without doing it, but sometimes you've got to do it. And these kind of things sometimes leave us feeling slightly deflated and disappointed where you think about doing it and you're like, oh, what else can I do? You're immediately trying to think how you don't have to, you can get out of doing these. So I want us just to look at this list and for you to... to uh, Browse your, your eyes through it. And like I say, there's a whole whack. Um, so let's put them up, Londi. And I am not going to, you can just breathe a sigh of relief, I am not going to go through and explain every one of these abilities. And I also want to encourage you that you can go on our website, www.hispeoplepmb.coza, and we will have these slides up for you uh, very soon, and then you can download them onto your phone or whatever, and it'll be a whole lot clearer than photos, but you're welcome to take photos if you like. So, uh, I'm not even sure if I should try and read through them, but adapting, administrating, analyzing, building, coaching, communicating, competing, computing, connecting, consulting, cooking, coordinating, counseling, our counselors, the Sozo ministers, their ability is in being able to guide, to support, to listen to. Although Sozo is not about counseling, it is about listening and facilitating. So maybe it would come with the facilitating a bit. Decorating, designing, designing. Those who have a designing ability are the people that we called and when we said, can you come and be part of a team that helps us to put together the decor in our church when we were we were wanting to put together decor. And Cass Crickme is someone who's really good at that. And she'll come in and she sees a space and she can see, oh, I think that this thing would fit and make it look good. Do you think our building, our, our space, interior design space looks good? Do you enjoy it? I love it. I, I feel at home. I feel like it speaks about who God has made us to be. And that is part of the designing ability. Okay? Uh, who likes being around people who have an ability to cook? Amen. Who likes being around someone who likes cooking? Okay? Uh, again, I might highlight my son. He loves cooking. He gets in the kitchen and he's like, Mom, I want to make some cookies today or I want to this. And at 12, uh, he's almost at that age. He is cooking almost more than his sisters. And, and it's, he loves cooking. And I love that. <laughs> we, we benefit from it. Okay? And just going down, developing, directing, editing. Editing is such a powerful skill. And my dear daughter, sorry, I'm hitting on my children today. My, my dear daughter has written a book that is being released. We are printing it, and it should be ready this week on Wednesday or thereabouts. But my sister is really good at words and at English. And I felt like the Lord highlighting to me, get Carol, my sister, involved in editing Carol's book. And I was feeling a bit bad to, like, I'm giving her something to do extra. And, I, I mean, I have been editing it as well. And my sister has loved getting involved and using her abilities to help us with editing Abigail's book. And she has read it through four times already and still finding things. And her ability is editing, and she is using it to bless and to build up others. Encouraging, engineering. Okay, I'm not going to read through all of them. Uh, going through, I'm just going to highlight a couple more. Mentoring. Uh, mentoring, the ability to advise or guide or teach. And I want to, I want to highlight 
my husband's amazing mentoring ability. He mentors constantly. And my children are like, okay, dad, I know that. But he, he can't help but mentor, advise, teach, guide. If you're going something, somewhere, staff, do you notice? My husband will mentor you. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will tell you how to do things because he has an ability in mentoring. And if you are wanting mentoring, I would encourage you, come and ask him, can you mentor me a little bit? Give, be willing to receive. Um, uh, performing, the ability to sing, speak, dance, play an instrument, act out. I would submit to you, our worship team, aren't you glad that they have an ability in performing? Amen? Amen. Welcoming. We are so grateful for our hosting team and our ushering team who make a point of welcoming people. Of They are using their abilities and it is making us as a body feel more connected and like we belong. And so these are some of the, some of the ways. And I'm, I'm trusting that as you look at this list, I want to invite you to tick off in your minds five or ten of these. It's, you don't have to feel, oh, I'm being greedy by saying, I can do that and I can do that and I can do that. Or like, no, I'm, I'm prideful. The problem is that for so many of us, we do not acknowledge and step out with our abilities and take hold of them and operate in them. And there may be things here that are not, that you are good at, but are not on the list. And I want to encourage you, go and write them down in your journal. And we are going to be outworking this in the next few months with, as, with our leaders, with our, within our connect groups, etc., and for it to help you to be able to discover your shape. And for example, I know that I am really good at gathering. Now, gathering is not on this list, but I know I am good at gathering. And I'm getting, I'm like, it's okay. I like to gather people. I like to bring them in and make them feel part of things. And that's, and that is something that God has given me. And for me to say, let me use that. And one of the, one of the sadnesses, Max Lucado, uh, put it like this. And I just, I, I just put a picture, just click again. Londi, um, there's a picture there of a, an attic or an old shop that has got a whole lot of, of items in that are just stored there and have got a use and could be really helpful. Can you see that picture? But it's just sitting in the corner like junk. Now, I want to submit to you, do you want to be junk? God does not want your life to be like that. And Max Lucado uh, put it like this. He said, to find me, look over in the corner of the shop over there, behind the cobwebs beneath the dust in the darkness. There are scores of us, broken handles, dulled blades, cracked iron. Some of us were useful once, and then many of us never were. But listen, don't feel sorry for me. Life ain't so bad here in the pile. There's no work. No anvils, no pain, no sharpening, and yet the days are very long. And I want to invite you that you say, I don't want my life to be like that. I don't want that to describe my abilities, that they are sitting in the corner 
and not being of any benefit to anyone, even you. And that you, what are you doing with your abilities? What are you doing with your life? Because our world needs you. This church needs you. We really need you. And I want us just to look at these other two pictures as well. To me, pictures speak a thousand words. What can you see there? On the right, there's a piano. What is a piano meant to do? In the hands of a master pianist, it is meant to bring out beautiful sound. It is meant to stir people's hearts and bring worship to our Creator. But here it's been left in the rain and it's got weathered to the degree that it possibly would not make the sounds it should make anymore. But if it was brought, maybe a, a master could fix it up, could tune it up, and could make it sound the way that it's meant to. And I want to invite you not to let your life be like this piano. To say, are there things, are there aspects, are there, is my life fulfilling the calling? Am I using my abilities in a way that brings glory to God? That is the fullness. And maybe you are, but to some degree. But there are giftings and, and, and abilities that are lying dormant. And why did I put a pen there? Because Andrew Murray said this, and I want you to think about it as you use pens and pencils this week. Andrew Murray made this analogy. He said, I have a pen in my pocket that is surrendered to its purpose of writing and must be surrendered to my hand if I am to write with it properly. So the pen first needs to be an agreement that it is made to write with and that that is its purpose. It is surrendered to its purpose of writing. But a pen is absolutely useless if it just lies on the desk. It needs to be picked up and written with for it to be of any purpose. And for many of us, our purpose, we are lose, we lose purpose as we lie dormant. And for some of us, it's like we, we, we're waiting for a time. But I want to encourage you, don't wait too long. Because otherwise we forget the, the delight of being in the Master's hand and allowing Him to use us and to create stories and beautiful things. And the other thing is that if someone else has partial hold of the pen, then the person who's meant to be writing with it can't hold it properly or write with it properly. And so if we hold back or we're allowing the enemy or other people to hold the pen with God, then the pen can't write very well. Do you get, get it? And so let's let God hold our abilities. I want to move on to P, the first P, personality. And I, I, my husband is meant to be giving time checks, but I don't think he was thinking about it. But I want to move on to personality. And Pastor Rick Warren says that personality is like stained glass. Our persona different personalities reflect God's light in many colors and patterns. And personality is quite a lot what we, when we go, to uh, a psychologist, and we they will get us to do personality tests. And I want to encourage you and say that there is no right or wrong temperament for being in ministry. Sometimes we can think that 
to be in ministry, we are needing to be loud and, and extrovert and be able to speak strongly and well. And there is a certain mold that we need to look like if we are going to be in ministry. I want to submit to you that that is totally not true. And that lie is potentially holding people back from saying, God is calling me to vocational ministry in, um, in, for him. And so we need all different kinds of personalities to balance the church and to give it flavor. And so, so there are many different personality tests and and some, I mean, many of you will have done personality tests. And there's some people, some examples of personality tests are, um, are where you might use animal names like the beaver or an otter or a lion to explain how these, well, what these animals like are like to reflect and show our kind of personality. There's, some, there's someone else who have used the words popular. You might be, are you popular, powerful, perfect, or peaceful? Which one of those four would describe you? Are you popular, powerful, perfect, or peaceful to describe you? Okay, that's another uh, description or, or set of descriptions that people can use. But maybe you're sitting here and going, what is personality? What does that mean? Well, Webster's Dictionary defines personality as this. It is the complex of characteristics that distinguishes an individual. Our personality can affect the way we think, how we feel, how you act, how you make decisions, how you deal with change, how you solve problems. How you resolve conflict, okay? How you engage people, how you express feelings and compete or cooperate with others. This is our personality. This has got nothing to do with our ability. We may be good at computers or not good at computers, but Jono's personality is, is what will affect how he deals with conflict with his sister or with his mom, okay, his personality. How is he going to impact, how is he going to uh, manage and resolve conflict? How do you express your feelings, etc.? That is your personality. Our personality is this. God didn't create other people to please you. And he didn't create you to please other people. How did he make us? He made us to please him. He made us to please him. And he created all of us to relate differently, to feel differently, to react differently, and respond to life differently. He has made us different. So just as he made us with different abilities, he has also made us with different personalities. And today, and in the shape, in the shape uh, summary, the the way that we are going to look at personality is in these two dimensions. The one is how you relate to other people. And the second is how you respond to opportunities. And why are we looking at these? Is because within our church, relating with people is quite crucial. And within life. And with many personality tests, there are many ways of looking at it. And you can be like, it can be quite confusing to look at. Okay, the Enneagram, as Pastor Ark said last week, doing the Enneagram test. But you can do it, and then you come out with different, it's like, oh, am I this or am I that? Uh, I'm feeling like this on one day, and so when I do the test that day, then 
uh, maybe the results are going to come out like that. And God is not confused. He knows who he's made you to be. And so we're not wanting to cookie cutter people and say, you are a lion or you are a beaver or you are a person, peaceful personality. We are all mixes of how, um, of different aspects. But it is helpful to us to be able to look at how we, how we relate. What is our personality like? So as I said, we're going to look at two dimensions of personality. How you relate to others and how you respond to opportunities. And under each of these, how you relate to others, how you respond to opportunities, there are several um, scales that we can look at. And, and we're trying to make it so it's not complicated for you. Okay, so how you relate to others. If we can just go to this table here. We have put here three scales under how you relate to others. And I want you to encourage you, as I describe it a little bit, that you look at where would you circle, where would you put your circle? Would you put your circle under, um, under outgoing, where you are very comfortable to relate to people? Okay? And so, I want to read just four things for outgoing or reserved, and it's just going to give you an example. So would you put your circle close to outgoing, or would you put your circle close to reserved, or maybe you would put the circle quite a lot in the middle, because it depends on different circumstances how you would be. So which of these statements best describes you? I tend to dot, dot, dot. Look for ways to be part of the crowd. Okay? I tend to look for ways to be part of the crowd. Or, and, or, I build deep relationships with a few individuals as opposed to many people. Here's another statement. I tend to start conversations with people I don't know. Okay, so that would be more, if you say yes to that, you are more on the outgoing side. Or, I tend to hesitate in being part of a large group. That would be more on the reserved side. Okay? Let's look at self-expressive or self-controlled in terms of how you relate to people. You self-expressive or self-controlled. If you tend to be open and verbal with your thoughts and opinions and, and enjoy sharing them with others, you would be considered self-expressive. Okay? But by contrast, if you tend to keep your thoughts and opinions to yourself, you may be described as self-controlled. So let's look at these four uh, little points. I tend to share my feelings freely with those I have just met. So that would be self-expressive. Or I tend to withhold my thoughts and feelings from others at certain times. I might seek opportunities to share my life with others. Or I tend to hold my cards closer to my chest so that only a few individuals can truly know me. Okay? Can you see how it's working? Okay, cooperative or competitive at the, the third sort of scale for how you relate to others. Do you commonly accept the opinions of others without disagreement? Is it your aim in life to resolve conflict as much as possible, attempting to live peacefully with others at all times? If so, you're more likely to be more cooperative in relating to others. Okay, so let's look at this. I tend to focus on making sure people are okay when I'm around them. That's cooperative. 
Competitive, I find importance in achievements. Embracing conflict and enjoying winning. Or are you looking for ways to make others content? Okay, so looking at that, um, at that scale of cooperative or content. And looking, I want to move on to how do you respond to opportunities? How do you respond to opportunities? And I'm not going to give the I tend to's with this table. But if you look at this here, how do you respond to opportunities? This scale. Do you like to take risks? High risks? Or would you rather focus on things that are low risk? You're not going to push in to where there is a high risk. You prefer things that are to do with people rather than with projects or with tasks. You, you graduate in your personality more towards projects or tasks. You prefer to follow someone else than to lead. How do you find yourself uh, when you are in a scenario where there's a group of people? Will you step up and lead or you will feel totally uncomfortable to do that. Do you like to work in a team or do you prefer to do stuff solo on your own? Do you like things that are routine, the same things every day? That is your personality. Or do you like variety? So our personalities, looking at that, and as I said, I want to encourage you, circle that, think about it, go on our website, look at these slides, and examine it and explore it more for yourself uh, as, as, so that you can process it as we go forward. So the second P that I want to highlight is prophetic identity. And this is, this is a part of us that God speaks to us. This is who I have made you to be. We are not who the world says we are. We are who God says we are. And we need to be pushing in and saying, God, will you show me? Will you speak to me? And this is God supernaturally, him giving you downloads of who he's made you to be, the abilities, the, the calling that he has put on your life that is yours alone. And... We cover this when we do uh, prophetic training and we show you, we help you to, to outwork and to flow with your prophetic identity. And so when God is speaking, first of all, God declares his identity. In Exodus 3 verse 14 and 15, he says, I am who I am. He declares his identity and he speaks it. But... He, he, said, he said in Genesis 1 verse 27, I have created you in my image. He has made man and woman in the image of God. And so when he is declaring his prophetic identity, your prophetic identity, often he is calling us to, to call out and to speak out who he is as we outwork who he has made us to be. And so when God speaks to us, he, and, and he, gives, he gives prophetic words, someone declares and speaks a prophetic word over us, he is declaring our identity. And we can follow the example of Jesus when Jesus was on earth and even before in prophecies, Jesus made many I am statements about himself. And for example, John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is declaring, I am. And God wants us, he, he's inviting you to say, say what you are. Say what he has said about you. I am a bringer of life. I am one who brings breakthrough as I play the drums. I am. And it is not a prideful thing to step into the calling that God has given us, that he has, 
He has spoken over our lives for us to step into it and to declare it. And I just, I've, I've given a short summary just how do we apply prophetic uh, personal prophecy in being able to put together our prophetic identity. And uh, you won't have time to do this now, but we have recently, a couple of weeks ago, we asked our prophetic teams to be up here giving prophetic words. What have you done with those prophetic words? What has happened with those words? And I want to encourage you, do this with each word that you receive. Write it out in full, noting the promises that God gives us. Note every descriptive word or idea that comes through that word. And then write that word out again, but start with, I am, or God sees me as. God sees me as a a singer who can declare the promises of God, and as I declare them, they, they resonate with people's hearts and they are set free. Amen? Pearl, as you were standing here this morning, when I looked at you, I looked and I saw the, the person who heads up worship for Hillsong International. And I, was, and I looked again and was like, ooh, it's Pearl. And I felt like God speaking. And I was like, why does he do that? Because he's, he's showing, he's giving an idea of the, the potential that there is within you. That that similar kind of anointing of breakthrough that is on her, that he has put within you. And he's saying, rise up, stand up, because it's powerful. <laughs> you are powerful, girl. Amen. So write down, I am. God sees me as. Ask yourself, then, once you've done this, in what ways am I living below this standard? In what ways am I living below what God has spoken to me? We so often, we, it's nice to hear nice words. It's nice to hear God has said this about you. You're an amazing this or that. And it tickles our ears at the time. It tickles our hearts. But it's going to be like water off a duck's back if we don't take it and receive it and work it into our prophetic identity. Because then God says stuff. God is the creator. He created the heavens and the earth. How did he create them? He spoke. So he is speaking. And when God created Adam and Eve, he spoke and he molded. Did he mold with his hands or did he mold with his mouth and the words that he spoke? And the substance was responsive to his words. Is your, the clay of your heart responsive to the words that God is speaking over you? He is speaking them even today. In you looking at those lists of words and he is declaring, Holy Spirit is jumping things out at you and saying, this is who you are. These are the abilities I've put within you. And so... I want to encourage you, tap into the P squared, the second P of shape. I want to move on to the last bit of shape, which is experiences. And I want to invite you just to close your eyes and picture this. Imagine yourself walking down a long hallway. And on the walls are paintings that reflect life-shaping moments in your life. On one side are the portraits of experiences 
that brought you excitement, achievement, and fulfillment. And on the other side, hang pictures of experiences that cause pain, frustration, and remorse. And they are difficult experiences. And I want to invite you, what are some of the pictures? As you're just, your eyes closed, you're looking. What are some of the pictures that you see on the left hand, on the one side? Okay, for me it's the left hand side. What it may be the other side for you. That are those pictures that are experiences that brought you excitement, achievement, and fulfillment. They are positive experiences in your life. Are some of those pictures popping out at you? And on the, on the opposite side, on the other side, on the other wall, are the difficult experiences. What are some of those experiences that are highlighted for you? might be as, as a child. It might be at the beginning of lockdown, an experience that happened that was really painful, where you lost your job. You were told that you're not needed anymore. Those painful experiences. Maybe it's when there was some abuse that occurred in your life. It's very painful. And I want to encourage you, when you're ready, you can open your eyes. But actually, let's just keep our eyes closed quickly, and I just want to ask Holy Spirit, I want to invite you, Holy Spirit, to be present with us as we look at the the experiences of our lives. And I want to invite you, Holy Spirit, help us to celebrate our victories and to take the pains and the difficult experiences, Holy Spirit, and bring them, help us to use them to bring glory to God, that they would not be wasted. Nothing is wasted in God's kingdom. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to use our difficult experiences for your glory, to take us there to explore how we can use them. We offer them to you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you just to look at your our lives and look at those experiences that you um, that you maybe felt came to mind. And they may be in these areas, they may be in others, but these are some of the areas that we can look at experiences, our experiences in. Okay? In our personal, our personal aspect or spiritual. You may have experiences there, achievements that you would consider achievements. And achievements are not things where you got recognition from other people necessarily. It might be. But an achievement may be something that you felt that you accomplished something for your own benefit. Like you managed to finish reading a book where you haven't had time for ages to be able to read a book and to complete it. Or maybe you battle with learning challenges and to read a book is a real achievement. And so, and an achievement may be that you overcame the anxiety, the, the fear or the intimidation of speaking to someone about Jesus, that you've been praying for them for a long time and you really wanted to speak to them about the Lord. And you, the Lord opened a way and you stepped through that door and you shared Jesus with them. And whether they responded or not, um, the fact is that you were able to share with them 
and, and give them something that they can think about and work through. So that would be an achievement. But in our personal and our spiritual life, there may be pains or disappointments where something happened and it was painful in your personal life. Uh, in our vocational area, the area where you work, there may be an achievement that you have accomplished something. You you felt like you have you have had a bucket list item in your work, and you've done it. Okay, a bucket list item is something that you said I want to do sometime in my life, and I I'm going to be able to do it. And but maybe there's been a pain or a disappointment within our workspace, relational, where Perhaps your marriage is going, you have a good marriage and your marriage is going well. That would be an example of an achievement within our relational space. You have friendships that are rich and deep and you can celebrate them and say, I, I, this is, it's something, it's a good positive experience for me. But maybe there are pains or disappointments in our relationships. And it's difficult for you in some places, or there's some relationships that have broke, uh, that have that are broken, and that that are not in a good place at the moment. Ministry, our experiences within ministry. Where have you served before? Where there is their experience of serving? Maybe there have been some pains or disappointments in ministry, where. You just felt like things didn't work out when you were within a ministry area or there weren't enough people where you wanted to serve and there weren't enough other people to come alongside and to make it happen. And so um, it was a disappointment. Educational. For many of us, when we think of an achievement, we may think of the certificate that we received. But it could be something much that's not recognized by other people, but you have, you have experienced an achievement there. And for many of us, unfortunately, we will have experienced pains and disappointments in the educational area. And I want to encourage you that our experiences are part of who we are, who God has made us to be. And he wants to invite you to bring those experiences to him and allow him to use them. Not just our abilities, not just our personalities, not just our spiritual gifts, but bring our experiences to him as well and allow him to use them. But before, okay, so with this, sorry, just go back to the table. I didn't give you instruction there. With this, We encourage you to try and put into each of those boxes. Again, we're going to spend time with this uh, in a while, but for you to process and to work with it, put it about three things. We want to encourage you, write about three things down into each of those boxes, okay? Under each of those sections. So achievements in relational and pains or disappointments in relational. Two or three, try and just work it for yourself. Okay, but let's go on to the next slide. Before our experiences, both positive and negative, can be fully used by God for the benefit of others, we must let go of their hold over our lives. Friends, Our positive experiences can hold us and can manipulate us in ways that are not godly, just as our difficult experiences can be, um, can influence us negatively. But before we can be fully used by God for the benefit of others, we must let go of their hold over our lives. Until we fully yield control of our lives to God, we'll remain stuck in neutral, roadblocked 
and getting nowhere fast. I want to invite you. If you're feeling like you're stuck, you're not moving forward, are there experiences that you have not allowed God and you have not fully yielded them to the Lord? Because He is wanting us to move way beyond those painful or difficult experiences. And so I want to just finish with the scripture and then invite you, uh, invite you to, to respond in a certain way. So I just want to finish with Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, where God says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And I want to invite us, can we just pray and thank God for how he has made us? And then I'm wanting to, at the end of, our, of my praying, I'm wanting to invite you, if you have difficult experiences that you are feeling have caused you to be stuck, and to be saying that I am not moving forward, that I'm not operating in the fullness of who God has made me to be. I want to invite you at the end of our praying to just put your hand up. And then I'm going to ask um, a, few of, a few people to, to just come and not, not stand close to you, but just to um, stretch their hands and to pray with you for that. In fact, um, I, I will ask you to just come to the front. It's probably easier um, with social distancing and to pray, pray with you. So can we just pray and, and thank God if you can just pray with me and let us just say, Father God, thank you for how you have created me. Thank you for my shape. Thank you for putting me together in my mother's womb. I do praise you and say I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Please forgive me, Lord, where I have envied other people and wanted to be like them without embracing who you have made me to be. Please forgive me, Lord. And Holy Spirit, help me, show me how to be all you have made me to be. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now I invite you, if you are feeling stuck in neutral, roadblocked because of painful or difficult experiences, or even if you're feeling like you're stuck because of positive experiences, I invite you to come to the front. And I have uh, have spoken with one or two of our SOZO ministers and, and others that are involved leaders, if you can come and pray together as well. So I want to invite you, go out, be who God's made you to be. Be your shape. I invite you to explore, go on our website, look at the slides, and work through some of this. Because as we do so, we will be able to fulfill who God's made us to be. Amen and amen.